Greetings, psych students and indeed psych teachers. Before you launch into the course proper, I believe it is useful, if not imperative, that students demonstrate a sound grasp of the mechanics of the nervous system. Because the nervous system gets a heavy degree of airplay throughout the Unit 3-4 course in particular. For instance, we look at the functionality of divisions of the nervous system, the structural components of the neuron itself, we look at synaptic transmission and the neural basis of memory, um, specifically the lock and key mechanism as well as LTP and LTD. We look at the effects of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So consider this video a prelude of what, what's to come. Hope it's of use. So before we get into the specifics of the mechanics of the nervous system, let's focus on the terminology, two words, nervous system. So nervous derived from the word nerve cell that carries information between the brain and other parts of the body. And a system is a set of things working together as part of a mechanism of an interconnecting network. So the point there is that neurons aren't just randomly located, they don't just fire on their own. It's an organized system with neurons that are strategically located and organized in terms of the way they're wired throughout the body and the brain. So put that together and we have the definition of the nervous system, a complex collection of nerves and cells known as neurons that transmit or send signals between different parts of the body. And I like this metaphor at the end here. It's essentially the body's electrical wiring system. So in the body, we have a variety of bodily systems, each with their own functionality, but they work together. Uh, an illustration of this is if we look at the endocrine system and the nervous system. So for instance, when we're threatened, uh, and you'll look at this a bit later on in the course, the nervous system, specifically the amygdala, will first register that we're under threat. It'll send a distress signal to the hypothalamus. And then the brain, the central nervous system, figures out that we need to increase the arousal. So therefore, it, it sends a signal to our endocrine system, which basically comprises of um, a bunch of glands that secrete hormones. And the effect of this is that the adrenal gland will release stress hormones such as adrenaline and noradrenaline, and in the second wave of the response, some cortisol. So the nervous system is influencing activity in the endocrine system in order for us to best respond to changing conditions in our environment. So the key functions of the nervous system are threefold. First of all, we need to basically have our sensory nerves uh, gather and then convey that sensory information via neural impulses towards the central nervous system. Secondly, we need our central nervous system to process this sensory input. And some of this sensory input comes from external, from the external environment, other from, from the internal environment, like the, the lungs, um, the heart, etc. And then finally, we need to respond to the information that we have in the brain by delivering message, messages to our effectors, such as our muscles and our glands, that will produce a necessary response. So the core unit of the nervous system is the neurons. We have about 100 billion of them in the nervous system. And I've already created some vision, um, some clips on the structure of the neurons, and I'll be updating these later on in the year. We have different types of neurons. We've got sensory neurons, interneurons, motor neurons. We've got big neurons. We've got small neurons. So the longest neurons in our body are basically in the somatic nervous system. So if, if we look here, we've actually got some um, neurons that reach out from the spinal cord to various uh, muscles and sensory organs in the body. So for, for instance, we've got here, we've got um, this, a cross section of the spinal cord where we have the cell body of a motor neuron that reaches all the way out to these effectors, which are various muscles in our, in our limbs, skeletal muscles attached to bones that trigger voluntary movement. So we've actually got these really long axons which conduct these neural impulses. And then on, on the flip side of that coin, uh, 
um, in order for us to process sensory information, particularly from the skin, we've got these long axons that um, conduct messages in the opposite direction. So our sensory organs detect sensory input, and then an action potential will convey that all the way along this axon to um, basically to get into that spinal cord area. So um, via these ganglion, which are clusters of connections, and then that sensory information will go up the spinal cord to the relevant part of the cerebral cortex where we'll process what we're um, seeing, feeling, touching, tasting, etc. In the brain, we've got just short of 100 billion neurons. So these neurons are quite small. Um, they're basically Each neuron in the brain is capable of forming up to 40,000 neural connections. And it's these connections that basically... Um, results in learning, memory, processing of information, deciding, etc. So I just want to touch briefly on, like I said before, some of the mechanics of the nervous system. It's important that you understand um, a pre and a post synaptic neuron. So pre means before, post means uh, after. Synaptic, we're talking about the gap between neurons. Neurons don't physically touch each other. So the, the presynaptic neuron is basically the sending neuron. And by pre, we mean the message prior to it entering the synapse, which is the gap. Post means after, that's the receiving cell. So that by postsynaptic, we mean a neuron that has received information via the synapse in terms of a neurotransmitter. Now, Neural transmission, we'll cover this in, in further depth um, a bit later on, but I just wanted to point out here that neurons communicate via electrochemical signaling. Electrochemical, what does that mean? Well, it requires a electrical signal in the form of an action potential to travel down the axon. So here we've got an axon terminal. This is on the presynaptic end of the equation. Neurons don't touch each other. So therefore, if an action potential is triggered, then we've got some vesicles here in the axon terminal. And when the action potential reaches that, that's going to result in neurotransmitters, which are the messages, and they're going to be diffused into the synapse, the gap. Now, these neurotransmitters are specifically shaped, and they're going to bind with matching um, shaped receptors on the postsynaptic end. Here we've got a dendrite, and here we've got some receptors. And when we get a match in terms of the, the, the molecular structure of the neurotransmitter and the receptor itself, then what's going to happen is we're going to get these ligand channels to open and we're going to, in, we're going to have an influx of either positively or negatively charged ions. Now, what causes neurons to fire? So teachers, this might be where you want to kill the video if you want to keep this up the sleeve for later on, but if not, just want to touch on this briefly. So given we've got about 100 billion neurons, just short of that, in the, in the brain, if they all fired at once, we'd have seizures, we'd have dysfunction, we'd have anxiety, and potentially we'd have death. So neurons have a charge, an electrical charge, which basically keeps them on standby. And what will cause them to fire is basically if the neuron can reach what we call an action potential. So they've got a resting potential. And the reason why the resting potential is negative, because just outside the cell um, body itself, the postsynaptic cell, we've got some charged ions. And inside the neuron itself, we've also got some charged ions. And the neuron itself is actually, in comparison to what's outside the neuron, it's actually negatively charged. And so therefore, we've got what we call a resting potential. Now, when we get the, as I talked about before, when we get these neurons, neurotransmitters, binding with the receptors, that's going to open up the line, ion channels, and we're going to get some positively or negatively charged ions into the postsynaptic membrane. If the effect of these um, ions that enter the permeate the cell membrane increase the actual charge of the neuron, and it actually reaches what we call here a action potential, then that neuron will fire. If it doesn't, if the charge is too weak, then the neuron won't fire. And that's kind of a good thing because 
Like I said before, if all neurons fired at once, we'd have nervous system dysfunction. I know that's a little bit confusing. I'll cover this in more depth later on in the course.